Okay, so this course, uh, more than any other course, I think is very experiential. We'll be doing a lot of meditation, and you'll be learning certain advanced techniques in meditation called Sutra Meditation. And in between, I'll try and explain things to you theoretically. Okay. So, um, let me ask you a question. Since you're here for a course called The Seduction of Spirit, what's your understanding of the word spirit? Yeah, anyone? Consciousness, who said that? Okay. So, yeah, we use the word spirit synonymously with the word consciousness. We're all conscious beings. Hopefully everybody is conscious at this moment. Okay? <clears throat> so, consciousness or being alive or what is called sentience is the same thing as spirit. Without consciousness, there's no life. Life and sin consciousness are synonymous. It is because of consciousness that we have any experience whatsoever. So, if you don't have consciousness, you can't see. If you don't have consciousness, then you can't hear, taste, or smell. All perception is based on consciousness. But not only is perception, which means what we see as the outside world, based on consciousness, but all what's happening inside us is also dependent on consciousness. So without consciousness, you can't think, you can't imagine, you can't uh, remember. All our internal experiences, memories, desires, emotions, they're dependent on consciousness. Our behavior is dependent on consciousness. Our Personal relationships depend on consciousness. Our um, social interactions depend on consciousness. Our connection to the what we call the environment, and hopefully by the end of this week you'll realize that there's no such thing as the environment. But uh, for now, our interaction with what we call the environment is dependent on consciousness. Forces are an expression of consciousness. So in the great tradition of Vedanta, there's a saying. And the saying is, if you can see it, if you can touch it, if you can taste it, if you can smell it, if you can imagine it, if you can conceptualize it, if you can visualize it, if you can think about it, then it's not real. Okay? It's an impermanent projection of something that you cannot see, something that you cannot smell, taste, or even conceptualize or imagine. And what is that? It's consciousness. That's real. You cannot conceptualize it, but without it, there would be no conception. You cannot imagine it, but without it, there would be no imagination. You cannot see it, but without it, there would be no sight. You cannot hear it, but without it, there would be no hearing. So what is more real? The impermanent projection that you can see or hear or touch or taste or smell or imagine, or that which cannot be imagined, which cannot be seen, which cannot be conceptualized, but without which Nothing is possible. So again, in this great tradition of Vedanta, there's a saying, know that one thing by knowing which everything else is known. It's the highest form of knowledge. You know, the word Vedanta means the end of all knowing. Veda means to know. It's the same as the English word, word. Veda, word, the German word, Vard, 
No, this is a very interesting word because it's also the origin of the word druid, druid priest, druvid. So to Veda means to know. Vedanta means the end of all knowing. Because once you know consciousness, then you realize that based on that, everything else can be known. Everything else can be known. So it's the highest form of knowledge. Okay, so let's let's do a little exercise right now to give you a little bit of inkling what we are talking about and where we're going to go with this this week. So close your eyes and uh, imagine that you're looking at a beautiful sunset on the ocean. Now let it go. Imagine that you're looking at a full moon and a starlit night sky. Let it go. Imagine that you're looking at a golden flame of a candle in a dark room. Let it go. Imagine that you're looking at the golf course that um, is somewhere here on the grounds. Imagine that you're looking at the face of someone you love. Okay, so we, we saw some sights. Now let us uh, keep our eyes closed and hear some sounds. Imagine that you're listening to a newborn baby crying. Imagine that you're listening to a dog barking in the middle of the night. Imagine that you're listening to the voice of someone you love. Now let's try some textures that we can feel. Imagine that your hands are touching the rough bark of a tree. Feel the sensation. Imagine that you're touching the soft petals of a rose. Imagine that you're touching the skin of a newborn baby. Feel the sensation. So, we saw some pictures, we heard some sounds, we felt some textures. Now let's imagine some tastes. Imagine that you're tasting strawberries. Imagine that you're tasting coffee. Imagine the taste of licking a lemon. Now let's try some smells. Imagine that you're smelling Chinese food. or an Italian kitchen, or the locker room in your gym. Okay, now please open your eyes. So, just now, I made some su suggestions, okay? I just made some suggestions, and you had a subtle intention. A subtle intention means a very faint intention. And that faint intention was in your consciousness. As a result of that faint intention, subtle intention, you had an experience. So, and where was that experience? Also in your consciousness, right? Now, imagine that I have the technology to look inside your brain, which these days we have. So these days, we can take a carbon atom, we can radio label it, we can put it in a sugar molecule, and then we can inject it into the bloodstream, and then we can take what are called positron emission tomography pictures of the brain. Or there are other techniques called um, magnetic resonance imaging. Okay. So there are different types of scanning techniques, and one can look inside the brain 
when you have those experiences. Okay? So a few minutes ago, I said, imagine a beautiful sunset on the ocean or a golden flame in a dark room. You saw a picture, right? Everybody saw a picture? But was there a picture in your brain? What was in your brain? In your brain, there was mainly electrical and chemical activity. Electrical and chemical activity. And this is activity between the connections of your neurons. Between neurons, there are certain, you can think of these very micro, nano um, cables. You might think of them as um, little cable channels. And along them, there were electrical currents going. And at the end of the electric bit where the neurons meet or are supposed to meet, there's a little gap. It's called a synapse. Over there, there's the release of chemicals. So when someone looks inside your brain, there's electrical activity or electromagnetic activity. Same thing. Whenever you have electricity, you also have a magnetic field perpendicular to it. And then there's a discharge of a chemical various kinds of chemicals, but predominantly two between synapses. They're called gamma aminobutric acid and something called glutamate. So one stimulates, the other depresses. And the electrical activity is also because of an electrical action potential, which is the exchange of ions across cell membranes. So in your brain, there is no picture the picture that you just saw of the sunset or the golden flame or the golf course was in your consciousness. And, of course, the question is, did the electricity in your brain produce the picture in your consciousness or did the picture in your consciousness produce the electricity in your brain? Or did you, now we come to who that you is, through subtle intention produce both? at the same time, that you actually produced both the electricity and the picture. The picture in your consciousness and the electricity in your brain. Did you do that? I think intuitively you recognize you did it. You had an intention, then you saw a picture. And I say picture, you heard a sound. You tasted strawberries in, in your consciousness. Okay, you um, You heard sounds, you tasted strawberries, you had experiences of texture, smell, etc. in your consciousness. And intuitively you feel that both things happen at the same time, the electricity in your brain and the experience in your consciousness. What's the connection between the two? Not clear. There is obviously a connection, right? <clears throat> but, you know, there are certain mysteries in science to which only one famous expression can be applied. Somebody, a great scientist, Sir Arthur Eddington, he once said, something unknown is doing we don't know what. Okay. We can say the same thing of this case. So right now you had an experience in consciousness. We can say it was an experience in your imagination. And it was an experience in consciousness, and it was orchestrated through subtle intention. Subtle intention means faint. Because when I said, look at a sunset, you didn't say to yourself, how do I look at a sunset? Okay, you just had a faint intention. You didn't ask yourself, how do I create the picture of a sunset? You just did it with a faint intention. Okay, now let's take something else. Somebody want to tell me what color this is? Orange. Is there an orange beam of light coming from here to your eyes? No, right? Otherwise we'd see orange beams. What's coming from here to your eyes is an invisible electromagnetic disturbance. Okay, Electromagnetic means, again, electricity, magnetism, 
basically photons. Photons, electromagnetic fields are called virtual photons. Photons are the carriers of the smallest units of energy in the whole universe. Okay. So a photon is the smallest unit of energy and also of information in the whole universe. So some invisible electromagnetic energy is coming from here to your eyes. But what's coming from here to your eyes doesn't have orange color. Clear? It stimulates your eyes. It causes a chemical reaction and, and the retina. And from there, an electrical current goes to your brain. And I think you would agree that the electrical current that goes from your eyes to your brain is not orange in color. It's just an electrical current. Once it gets to your brain, again, same synaptic nerves, you know, there are synaptic firings, which means electrochemical activity between neurons. Okay, Think of these as little fiber optic channels, cables between your neurons. And that electrochemical activity with the same two chemicals. And then where is the orange? Where's the orange produced? Okay, in your consciousness. So is orange the color of this flower or is orange an activity in your consciousness? Orange is an activity in your consciousness. What's over here? Well, if you really want to get down to it, this is made up of molecules and the molecules are made up of atoms. And the atoms are made up of subatomic particles. And these subatomic particles are fluctuations of energy and information in a huge emptiness. There's no color out here. In fact, one of the greatest scientists um, who actually was responsible for describing synaptic um, firings, you know, amongst others, um, Sir John Eccles, he was an Australian, he won the Nobel Prize in physics, and I think in neuroscience, I forget now, but he was a Nobel laureate, and he said, there are no colors in the real world. There are no textures in the real world. There's no beauty, no ugliness, nothing of the sort. And now I'm paraphrasing. What really exists is a radically ambiguous and ceaselessly flowing quantum soup which means energy that's vibrating. And the color is an activity of your consciousness, not, not an activity of your brain, because whether you're imagining something or whether you're seeing something, in your brain the activity is the same. In your brain the activity is exactly the same, whether you're imagining it or seeing it. And so the experience of color is in your consciousness, okay? Now, of course, you're also listening to my voice. I'm vibrating my vocal cords, right? Does the vibration of my vocal cords produce sound? Yes or no? No, it doesn't. When vib vocal cords vibrate, they vibrate. And there is some, there's some, some air in my voice box, in my windpipe, and the air in my windpipe starts to vibrate. That causes the vibration of this atmosphere. The vibration of the atmosphere makes no noise. That causes the vibration of your eardrums, and there inside your ears there are certain hairs. They're called cilia, which is another term for hairs, very fine hairs. And they start to move, and that creates an electrical current to your brain. The electrical current that goes to your brain makes no sound. So where's the sound? It's in your consciousness. Is it in your brain? No. Is it in your nerves? No. Is it in your eardrums? No. Is it in this atmosphere? No. Am I making it? No. 
The sound that you're hearing is an activity of your consciousness. Are you getting this? Okay. So, this color is in your consciousness. The sound that you're hearing is in your consciousness. What's in the universe is just vibrations, period. And most of the vibrations at the most fundamental levels are electromagnetic vibrations. Okay. In the universe, just vibration, energy vibrating at different frequencies. In your nervous system, energy vibrating. In fact, your nervous system is also energy vibrating because it's made up of the same stuff. Your nervous system is made up of molecules, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, which are made up of the same stuff as this flower, as the same stuff as this chair. Every, everything is a vibration of energy. Everything. But color is in your consciousness. Sound is in your consciousness. Texture is in your consciousness. Taste is in your consciousness. Smell is in your consciousness. But when you close your eyes and experience color, taste and smell, you call it imagination. When you open your eyes and you have the same experience, you call it the real world. What we call the real world is actually a experience in consciousness of color, form, taste, texture, smell. It's all inside our consciousness, the whole thing. Whether we call it imagination or memory or the real world. And there is no inside or outside. Because it's all in your consciousness. There's a beautiful poem of Rumi where he says, I've lived on the lip of insanity, wanting to know reasons, knocking at the door, the door opens, I've been knocking from the inside. There is no outside. It's all contained in your consciousness. So the essential nature, and I'm simplifying this because it can get complicated, but I'm simplifying this. Whether you experience sound, touch, sight, taste, or smell, it's all happening in your consciousness. It's all the translation of vibrations. This vibration, we very frequently when scientists talk about this vibration, they call it discontinuity. Discontinuity because something that goes on and off. Okay. Our experience of continuity is in consciousness when the universe is actually one of discontinuity, which means vibrations going on and off. And this is true of all experience, whether it's sound, touch, sight, taste, or smell. It's all based on discontinuity. Okay, so if I put my hand on your thigh and I don't move it, then after a while you won't know it's there. But then if I start to move it again, you might say, what the heck are you trying to do? There is no experience in the absence of vibration. But we don't experience the world as vibrations. We experience the world as color, as form, as sound, as taste, as smell, which are activities in our own self. Okay? So far, clear? So if you really understood, then answer the following question. Where is Deepak right now? In your consciousness. Okay, where is this microphone now? Where is your own body? Where are your thoughts? Okay, it's all inside you. So here's the first principle. You are not in your body. Your body is in you. You are not in your mind. Your mind is in you. And you're not in the world, the world is in you. There's a very famous line, by the way, in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna explaining yoga to the great warrior Arjuna. And he says in Sanskrit, prakratim swam vashtabhai vishrajami punapuna, curving back within 
myself, I create again and again. I curve back within myself, I create the mind. I curve back within myself, I create the body. I curve back within myself and create the whole universe. So it seems like we've got it upside down because we say, you know, my soul is in my body, my body is in the world. It's the other way around. The world and the body are in your soul. If by soul we mean the core consciousness in which all experience occurs. Now, we cannot deny that we have consciousness. You know, you can deny everything else, but you can't deny the fact that you're conscious. It's the feeling of being alive. It's the feeling of having experience. Okay, so we've established some very important points right now. That the world exists in your consciousness, the body exists in your consciousness, and the mind is in your consciousness. These are all activities of yourself in yourself. Agreed? Okay. Now let's go a little more into this. Everybody says, okay, now I agree that, uh, you know, everything's happening in consciousness. Where the heck is it? If I go inside your brain, will I find you there? And the answer is, I won't find you there. If I go inside your body, will I find you there? I won't find you there. People have done all kinds of experiments. And in fact, the best scientists cannot locate consciousness. They cannot find you in your body. And of course, there's a very simple, the very simple, um, hypothesis in science, it's called, or principle, I should say, in science, it's called Occam's Principle. Occam's Principle, named after a scientist called Occam, and it says when you don't have an explanation for something, then the simplest explanation is probably the best explanation. So what would be the simplest explanation that you can't be found in your body? You're not there. Okay. You're not in your body. Of course, we said that. The body is in you. You're not in the world, the world is in you. You're not in the mind, the mind is in you. Still doesn't help too much. You say, but I want to know this person. You know, after all, okay, I agree, I'm not in the body, I'm not in the mind, I'm not in the world, but then where am I? Again, science has been unable, as I said. And there are some great scientists today, some great scientists, philosophers, who say when you can't find it, you know, it's probably consciousness doesn't exist. That it is not, it's something that's a hallucination. That probably doesn't exist. There's a scientist called Daniel Dennett who's very famous. They deny the existence of consciousness. Okay, but can you deny that you don't exist? It's the one thing that you can be sure of, that you exist. So here is something which is a little controversial, but more and more scientists gradually are coming to this understanding that consciousness is in the discontinuity. That means it's in between the vibrations. In between the vibrations. The vibration itself is energy, information, and this is something that... Is part of our technology today when you send somebody nature of the material world is not, that it's not material. That the essential nature of the physical world is that it's not physical. It's vibration. So we know that the vibration has energy and information, but what's in between the vibration? What's in the discontinuity? And a number of people are beginning to understand that discontinuity may be consciousness itself. Okay, here are five things you can remember about discontinuity. Number one, when we look inside the discontinuity, there is no energy there, there's no information there, there is no space time there, and there are no objects there. No energy, no information, no space time, and no objects. So, what's there? And the best answer science can give us is there are infinite possibilities. That the discontinuity 
or consciousness is a field of infinite possibilities. It's the immeasurable potential for all that was and all that is and all that can be. It's the potential for space-time, energy, information, and objects. So, consciousness is not in space-time. Consciousness is not in space-time. It's where the experience of space and time happens. Where are you experiencing space right now? Right? You see, you're looking at me, okay, and you say there is some space here. But you can't see space, right? Space is not a sensory experience. You can see the objects, you can't see space. Space is created in your consciousness. Where is time created? In your consciousness. But your consciousness is not in space-time. Your consciousness is spaceless, which means it doesn't occupy space. It's timeless, which means it has no location in time. So when you say, I'm looking for consciousness, you're looking in the wrong place. Because consciousness does not occupy space. Consciousness does not exist in time. It's timeless. You, who is consciousness is spaceless and time, timeless and dimensionless. And without you, the spaceless, dimensionless consciousness, there is no space-time. There are no objects, there's no energy, there's no information. Again, teaching of the Bhagavad Gita, when Lord Krishna describes this to Arjuna, he says, water cannot wet it, wind cannot dry it, weapons cannot shatter it, fire cannot burn it. It has no beginning in time, it has no ending in time. And therefore it cannot die, because only that which began ends. But that which never began has no ending. Okay, spaceless, timeless, dimensionless, but without which... No space, no time, no dimensions whatsoever. So that's the first thing to recognize, that consciousness is a field of possibilities, and you, that field of possibilities, do not exist in space or time. So stop looking for consciousness in space-time. The reason you're here is you're here to get in touch with consciousness. And when you get in touch with consciousness, is who's getting in touch with consciousness? Your consciousness is getting in touch with consciousness. So when consciousness is looking for consciousness, that by definition is a subjective experience. Any objective evidence of consciousness, by examining the brain or doing PET scans or MRIs, any objective evidence of consciousness is at best inferential. Inferential means indirect. Science will never be able to find consciousness objectively. It can only infer circumstantially. You know, I recently gave a talk in LA and one of the people who attended the talk was a famous lawyer called Gloria Allered. You probably heard of her. And I said to her, you know, the consciousness, the, the evidence for consciousness objectively would never be admitted in court. Okay, because it's circumstantial evidence. Okay, the only direct evidence is you. You exploring consciousness subjectively, which is what we're going to do here. Okay, so the first attribute of consciousness, infinite possibilities. The generator of space-time, energy, information, and matter but not existing in space-time. You know, when there was, I don't know if you read the debate between, um, between Richard Dawkins, who's the most important, let's say, most well-known atheist of our time, um, and Francis Collins. Francis Collins is the head of the Genome Project, and he's a, he's a Christian, observing Christian. He believes in God. 
And Dawkins, of course, does not believe in God uh, because the God he's trying to attack actually doesn't exist. Um, but one of the things in that debate was uh, Francis Collin does say to Dawkins, the reason you can't find God is you're looking in the wrong place. Okay, You're looking in space-time when God exists outside of space-time. God is the creator of space-time. And so to you, your consciousness, which is part of that infinite consciousness, exists outside of space-time. Okay, so that's the first attribute of consciousness. The second is it's a field of non-local correlation. Non-local correlation means everything in the whole universe is correlated with everything else in the whole universe instantly faster than the speed of time. Everything is entangled with everything. Everything is in harmony with everything. And actually, when you look at biological organisms and activity in nature, things don't happen one at a time. Things all happen all at the same time. A human body, for example, has a hundred trillion cells, which is more than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Each cell in your body can do 100,000 activities per second, and every cell instantly correlates its activity with every other cell. How can a human body think thoughts, play a piano, kill germs, remove toxins, and make a baby all at the same time? And while your body can do that, it tracks the movement of stars and planets because your body is a symphony of the whole universe. The whole universe. That's why we call the universe the universe. One song, one symphony. And your body is a symphony, but so is this, right? So is this. This is everything coming together, rainbows and sunshine and earth and water and wind and air and the infinite void and the whole universe's history is contained in this flower. Okay, this is also a symphony of the whole universe. And this and you and the whole universe are instantly correlated, which means it's one harmonic, expression of consciousness. Okay, now, non-local correlation or entanglement or quantum mechanical relation, interrelatedness, you know, some people say a causal non-local quantum mechanical interrelatedness. The mathematical terms for describing, I would say, for describing omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence. Everything past, present, and future, and everything across space-time instantly correlated. Past, present, and future also, because distance in space is also distance in time. Second principle. Consciousness, therefore, first is infinite possibilities. Second is omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotence, which means you know everything you need to know. If you know your consciousness, then you know everything which doesn't mean you're like Wikipedia, okay? It means you have an intuitive knowledge of whatever you need to know when you need to know it, if you're in touch with your consciousness. It also means you have in infinite imagination and other things, but you know everything. At the deepest part of yourself, you know everything. You don't have to learn anything. The third attribute of consciousness is that it proliferates in uncertainty. It's a realm of uncertainty, of unpredictability. We don't need to go into the history of it, but basically there's a level of nature where the laws of nature preclude you from understanding the laws of nature fully. They become uncertain, which is very annoying to scientists because science is based on certainty. If, you know, if the laws of nature were not 100% predictable, we wouldn't be able to do science. But at the most fundamental levels, it's unpredictable. Famous expression of Einstein, God does not play dice with the universe. Famous expression of Stephen Hawking, God not only plays dice with the universe, he throws the dice where you will not find it. Okay, but actually Einstein had another expression. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, in so far as the laws of nature are real, they are not certain. In so far as they are certain, they are not real. Okay, there's a level of nature 
where there is unpredictability. And thank God for that, because if there was no uncertainty, there would be no creativity. A system that is closed and certain is a fixed system. There's no creativity. Which leads us to the fourth property of consciousness, leaps of creativity. Quantum leaps of creativity. Quantum leaps of creativity. Which means when you leap from one space-time event into a new space-time event, there's no direct algorithmic relationship between the previous and the next manifestation. Okay. If you watch the program Star Trek, when the captain says, beam me up, Scotty. Okay, Scotty disappears here, shows up somewhere else. Or when they say, jump into another dimension. Your imagination is like that. You leap in imagination. I say, okay, think of, think of um, where you are right now and then think of New York. You don't have to go from here to New York. You took a quantum leap. Or think of your childhood. You took a quantum leap. Or think of when you fell in love. There's no relationship between looking at this flower and saying, think of your teenage years. But you can jump from here to there without going through the space in between, in either space or time. So let's say the fourth expression of consciousness is quantum creativity, which is infinite. Infinite creativity. And finally, the fifth expression of consciousness, which is called observer effect, which was described by a great scientist called John Wheeler and others, who basically said that the physical universe does not exist unless there's a conscious being looking at it. There were no conscious beings looking at the universe, it would remain a vibration. The vibration becomes alive as the universe in your consciousness. It becomes color, taste, smell, all the things that we ascribe to the universe, but which are activities of our consciousness. Okay, so some form of sentience, some form of consciousness is required for manifestation of the vibration into the physical world. It could be anything. It could be a mosquito or it could be a butterfly or it could be a honeybee. So a honeybee looks at this flower. It doesn't see the same flower that you and I see because the honeybee's eye cells do not respond to the wavelengths of light that you and I respond to. But a honeybee can see honey from a distance because it senses in ultraviolet. A snake would experience this as infrared. A bat would experience this as the echo of ultrasound. A chameleon's eyeballs swivel on two different axes. You can't even remotely imagine what this would look like to a chameleon. So what is this? Before you observe it, it is infinite possibilities. In your consciousness, it becomes this. For some other species, it becomes something else. Just take a walk with your dog, and you'll see that your dog senses and experiences some things that you and I also are common experiences, and some things the dog will experience that are not common, because sensing a different spectrum of energy and information. So is that clear? Okay. Remember five things. Write them down. I am a field of infinite possibilities. Number two, I know everything. I'm omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. Number three, I'm a field of infinite possibilities. I'm omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. Number three, I embrace uncertainty. Thank God. Because if you're certain, then you're fixed. There's nothing. Yeah, I embrace uncertainty. Number four, I have infinite creativity. And number five, I co-create the whole universe with the mystery that we call God. A great Indian teacher, Krishnamurti, somebody heard him once and they said, 
I think the more I listen to you, I realize you must be an atheist. And Krishnamurti turned to him and he said, I used to be an atheist till I realized I was God. <laughs> so which annoyed the fundamentalist because he said, you're denying the divinity of Krishna. In America, we would say, you're denying the divinity of Jesus Christ. And Krishnamurti said, heavens, I've never denied anybody their divinity. Why would you do it to Krishna? You're all divine. We're all divine. Okay? Rumi he says, you're not, just, you're not just a drop in the ocean. You're the whole ocean in the drop. Okay? So the great Sufi teachers of Islam said the same thing. That you, your consciousness is a movement in the infinite consciousness. And we are all contained in that infinite consciousness, okay? We're sharing the same breath right now. We're sharing the same molecules right now. We're sharing the same energy field right now, the same information field. And we are all contained in one consciousness. If you really totally get this, then you realize there's nothing other than God, okay? We're all kind of an activity in the mind of God. Everything is happening in one mind. We are members of the same body. We are members of the same energy field. We are members of the same information field. We have the same breath that we share, which the Jews call Ruach Adonai. The Muslims call Ru. The Hindus call Brahman. The Greeks call Kanefma. One spirit. One spirit. And the goal here at this end of this week is to totally get that. Okay, not just intellectually. And when I say intellectually, you're pointing here, but your mind is not here. Your mind is outside of time. It's a very big mistake to think that your mind is here. Okay. Okay, so the goal is to get there this week. Okay. To get to a very deep, experiential, profound understanding. And I've already mentioned these five principles. Now, let me show you some slides to see if we can... This is the new book, by the way, which is based, just came out four weeks ago, and I have a new book coming out tomorrow called The Ultimate Happiness Prescription. They're based on more and more and more understanding of the one thing. And that is spirit, consciousness. Every book is about that, you know. It's just a little extension, deeper, deeper understanding consciousness. Okay, I already said that all of reality is a differentiated expression of consciousness. Without consciousness, none of these things. Now, what we learn in this course is that reality is different in different states of consciousness. We'll go deep into different states of consciousness during this course. We'll try and understand what is cosmic consciousness, what is divine consciousness, what is unity consciousness, what is soul consciousness, we'll go. And each level of consciousness creates its own reality. Relationships change or become different when we move to higher states of consciousness, but so does our perception, so does our thinking, so does our cognition, so do our emotions, and so does our biology. Our biology, which means our physical organism, is different in different states of consciousness. Because your physical organism exists in your consciousness. It's an activity in your consciousness. So how many people can see a skull here? And how many people can see a woman sitting at a drawer? What is on the screen? Photons. In fact, the screen itself is made up of photons, right? Even the screen itself is vib made up of vibrations, right? So the picture is in your consciousness. And whether you see a woman or you see a skull is a choice in consciousness. You make a choice in consciousness and then you recognize the choice you made in consciousness as the picture on the screen. 
when in reality there is no screen and there is no picture out there. What you're seeing is an activity of yourself in consciousness as either the woman or the skull. How many people can see a man playing a saxophone? A woman? Again, you're not doing anything to the picture of the, on the screen because there is no picture on the screen. Okay? And there is no screen either. They are both activities in your consciousness, as is your own body. How many people can see a word there? And what's the word? Famous poem of William Blake, We are led to believe a lie when we see with and not through the eye that was born in a night to perish in a night while the soul slept in beams of light. So for most people, their soul is sleeping. This week, wake up the soul so you can see beyond the lie. If you can see it, if you can touch it, if you can taste it, smell it, it's part of the lie. Okay? Don't trust your senses. How many people can see a young woman looking away? How many people can see a mother-in-law? Same picture, a little more interesting. We have the father-in-law, the mother-in-law, and the daughter-in-law. What you see out there is an activity in your own consciousness. How many people can see a bird? A rabbit? Okay, this is the world we inhabit these days because this is the world we have manifested. From a very primitive response that uses our reptilian brain, 300 million years old. When I was in medical school, we used to remember this brain as the four Fs, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and reproduction. And the projection of this state of consciousness is this world. Whether it's war, terrorism, poverty, all the epidemics of humankind, eco-destruction, it's an expression of a fragmented consciousness, a fragmented collective consciousness. But this could be another world that we create. That we move from that fragmented state of consciousness to a higher consciousness where we experience ourselves as how we really are. Is this the real body or is that the real body? Well, the physical body that you experience is experienced in consciousness, right? Can you experience your light body in consciousness? Sure, that's a choice. Just so like you saw the woman or the skull, you can see your body as this or you can see your body as that. It's a choice in consciousness. In fact, this is the real body. What the ancients call the light body or the astral body or beyond this, the consciousness body, the subtle body. And it's a subtle shift in consciousness. Just like when you saw those pictures, it was a subtle shift in consciousness, this or that. And if a number of us started to experience ourselves the way we really are, then it would be a different world. Okay, because the world is as we are. The world is a projection of our consciousness, just as the body is a projection of the consciousness. Thoughts are a projection of consciousness. It's a choice. It's a subtle shift in consciousness, a subtle intention. You know, when I said, imagine the sunset, that was a subtle intention in consciousness. So this week, all week, we'll be practicing sutras, which are subtle shifts in consciousness very subtle shifts in consciousness that will change our experience of ourselves. And when we change our experience of ourselves, then because reality is different in different states of consciousness, then we'll change our experience of the world. 
the world is a phantom, it's a dream in consciousness. Just like everything else is an impermanent expression of consciousness. Consciousness is the only reality. And if you can get familiar with this part of your being, then there is no fear of death, there is no craving, no addiction, there is no resistance, there is just joy, there is creativity, there is infinite energy because if there is one energy that... Okay, so these are just simple principles that we'll try and understand because this is the last book, it's an extension, that your body is a process, not a structure. Your body is an energy field. Your genes can be turned on and off. You can change your brain structure. You can change your telomeres, which are little buttons at the end of your chromosomes that shift your uh, genetic biological clock. You can change your relationship with time because time doesn't exist other than in your consciousness. And that the key to all this transformation uh, in your body is in your own consciousness. And we will also learn that this can only be done by going to the deepest level. When we go to the deepest level, then there is effortless spontaneity in choiceless awareness. Choiceless awareness means you allow the whole universe to flow through you and you just introduce subtle intention. This whole week, the sutra practice, which comes from the great teachers of yoga, like Patanjali and even going back in 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 mythology and history to the time of Shiva. Shiva is supposed to be the first yogi. Everything is subtle intention in consciousness. Now you know what subtle intention is. Just a little shift in quality of attention. And that the greatest mystery of the universe is love, which is the essence of our spirit. That when we are experiencing this part of ourselves, our core consciousness, we have boundless imagination and creativity. We invite grace. Grace is synchronicity, good luck, or the great feeling, the great presence that the divine is always present and that we are instruments for the evolution of the universe. And the most important principle, that we have a certain energy that never runs out. Okay, Because this, the energy of the universe is spiritual energy. It's the elements and forces of the universe. So this week, remember one principle. Is it easy? Is it easy? Is it fun? Am I getting results? If you can say yes to all three things, then you're plugged in. You're tuned in. If it's not easy, if it's not fun, and if you're not getting results, or even one of those things is missing, then you're not plugged in. We are the energy of the universe. We are the infinite creativity of the universe. We are the imagination of the universe. And as again Rumi says, by God, when you find yourself, when you see yourself, by God, when you see your beauty, you'll be the idol of yourself. Okay, now I just want to take you through an exercise. I want to go back to this slide. Okay, can everyone just look at this picture a little bit? Because we're going to do a subtle intention exercise to start this morning. We're going to do a subtle intention exercise so that we want to shift our experience of our own body from being a physical body to a light body in consciousness, which is closer to the reality, okay? So just look at this picture for a few seconds, and then I'm going to take you through an exercise. Okay, now close your eyes and put your attention in your heart. And just for a 
couple of minutes, let's experience gratitude for all the things that we could be grateful for. Gratitude is a way to unleash spiritual energy. Because when we experience gratitude, then our ego steps out of the way. Your ego cannot dominate you when you're experiencing gratitude. So just think of things that you could be grateful for with your attention in your heart. Let go. Now, everyone in this room has learned primordial sound meditation, the mantra that you received. So, very gently, with your eyes closed, introduce your mantra in your consciousness. It's just a way of going a little deeper. And remember, when you repeat the mantra, it's effortless. There's no concentration. It just comes and goes like any other thought. Okay, let go of the mantra now and bring your awareness, your consciousness into your whole body. Have awareness in your whole body, consciousness in your whole body, consciousness in every cell of your body. Your whole body is one lively, self-interacting, self-intelligent field of consciousness, of energy, of light. Experience this light in every cell of your body, just as you saw in the picture. But now experience it in your body. And all you have to do is have the subtle intention. Perfect order, perfect harmony, pure consciousness, pure energy, pure light in every cell of the body. Keep your awareness in your body till it bubbles with energy and light. Okay, let go now. Relax into your body. Take a minute or so. Slowly open your eyes. Okay, so from now on, at the end of every meditation, every meditation, for two minutes, have the subtle intention with your eyes closed to experience your light body. Nourish your light body, which is really the first principle of transformation. Nourish your light body at the end of every meditation through subtle intention. The key to transformation this week is choiceless awareness. What is choiceless awareness? No attachment to any outcome. 
when you're not attached to any outcome, then the whole universe is flowing through you. It's the highest form of intelligence. And then subtle intention. Just a little intention, let it go. And we'll be learning how to refine that. It's a delicate process, but that's what sutra practice is. And we'll be doing it this whole week. We're slowly opening every chakra with subtle intention in choiceless awareness. Okay. So we have a little time. Any questions on what we discussed this morning? Yeah? Microphone here. How would you differentiate uh, the concept of consciousness from awareness? Same thing. Okay. Awareness, consciousness, the same thing. Okay, but awareness without thought content is consciousness. Awareness with thought content is perception. Awareness without thought content is pure consciousness. Awareness with thought content is perception. Because you, without thought you can't have perception. You know, if you're, if you're sitting next to somebody at a party and you're having a conversation, then you're listening to each other and you don't hear whatever is happening in the background. But then somebody at the end of the room starts to talk about you and then even though you're having a conversation with this person, you don't hear a thing which they say, your attention is there. Okay, across the room. So without thought, there's no perception. All perception is movement of consciousness, which we call thought. Wait, please, the mic. Is consciousness actually the medium that everything is happening? Is consciousness the medium that everything is happening? We can say consciousness is the container of the whole universe. But consciousness is the, the activity of consciousness is what creates the experience of mind, body, and the universe. Okay, right now I'm seeing you there. Mm -hmm. That's a perceptual artifact, a socially induced hallucination. Okay? Actually, I'm having a subtle intention in my consciousness and I'm experiencing myself as you. But we'll get there slowly. Over here. Anyone? What's the difference between consciousness and prana? And? Prana. Prana, prana is energy. It's movement of consciousness. Okay. You're behind there. I hope I say this right. Um, what caused us to become? What caused us to become, answer is no one knows, but I think it was boredom. Each one of us? You know what they say in the Vedanta? They say just as movement is inherent in air, manifestation is inherent in consciousness. Consciousness cannot help conceiving, conceptualizing and becoming. It's its nature. Restlessness. How was consciousness created and is there a differentiation between any of us? Okay, so consciousness is a causal, which means, which I already said, as soon as you say, how is consciousness created, you're talking about space-time. Okay, so consciousness is a causal. Outside space-time has no beginning, has no ending, has the potential for beginnings. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> That's really interesting, huh? <laughs> so God, God suddenly showed up in the form of a mouse.
That that was meant to happen. Okay. We are talking about we are talking about God. So you know, manifestation in the form of a mouse is an interesting joke. And yeah, what's the message? Relax. <laughs> Laugh. Okay, I was saying consciousness is a causal. It's not created. It's the source of creation. And did you say the second part of your question was? Is there a differentiation between the consciousness of different people? Yes, because there are different activities of the one consciousness, but the activities are different. Okay? This wave different from that wave? Sure. But it's still the man behavior of the whole ocean. The rain is also the behavior of the ocean. The rainbow is also the behavior of the ocean. The waves are the, and the puddles, they are all different behaviors of the ocean. Okay, so we'll stop here and then we'll continue. You have one last question here. Is there a difference between us and the animals? Is there a difference between us and the animals? Well, just a difference in the level of expression of consciousness. But it's one consciousness, right? So there's no difference between you, animals, or the microphone that I'm holding. It's all you. So there's no us. There's only the one consciousness. So is it right to say that everything has awareness? Or it's actually awareness? Everything is in awareness. Everything is in awareness. Everything okay. is in awareness. And it's the interaction of the awareness with itself that it sees itself as the other. It's a very interesting, the process of creation is very interesting that in order to have experience, you have to see yourself as the other. Because if you don't, then there's no experience. And you have to create contrast also. You know, you have to create contrast. Up and down, backwards and forwards, good and evil, hot and cold. They're all differentiated expressions of your own self. But we have plenty of time to discuss. Thank you.